2016. And I think that a lot of those folks were also energized by Beto's candidacy, more, more because it's, it's not a traditional campaign tactic that he uses. So I, I think that, that maybe more than a policy alignment might right. have been what drew me. So sorry to interrupt, Jess, but watch this with me, okay? He's starting to make these remarks. This is live in Iowa. Thank you all for, for being with us and welcoming me to your community. Keokuk is the first stop in our campaign to be president of the United yeah. States. Yeah. And it is a huge, huge honor to be here with you. I just got a call from my wife, Amy, who's back in El Paso, Texas, where she is raising, sometimes with my help, Ulysses, who's 12 years old, Molly, who's 10, and their little brother, Henry, who is 8 years old. And she's getting them ready, feeding them, and then taking them to school. I, even though this is the first day, miss them terribly. But I'll tell you this, it's those kids, and it's your kids, and it's your grandkids and the generations that follow that push us out into the country to do this incredibly important work together. The challenges before us, I hope you agree, have never been greater than the greatest of our lifetimes. If you look at the crises in our economy, where the power has been concentrated into the hands of the privileged, the few, and the corporations, if you look at our democracy, which may very well be a democracy soon enough in name only, unless we get it back, and make sure that it represents people and not special interests and corporations. And if you look at the climate, which if in this 10 year window, we do not do everything we possibly humanly can, the generations that follow us, and I mean our kids in our kids' lifetimes, by the time Ulysses is my age, and he's 12 years old right now, we may not be able to live in some of the cities that we call home today, like El Paso, Texas. We may not be able to grow our own food and our own fiber, feed and clothe ourselves in this country. And if you think that a little more than 300,000 immigrants and asylum seekers apprehended on the southern border is a problem, and I don't necessarily think that it is, the kind of migration and refugee flows that we will see when entire bands of this world are no longer habitable will be a crisis of a different magnitude altogether. But these challenges, I am absolutely convinced, will bring out the absolute best in every single one of us. And we have something that almost no other country in the world has. We have the single greatest mechanism to call forth the genius of our fellow human beings. This democracy, more than 320 million people strong, can bring the ingenuity, the creativity, the resolve of an entire country. And each one of these challenges can and will be met. But the foundational challenge to get all of this done is to fix our democracy. Only when it works, and only when each one of us can work within it, will we be able to meet these threats. And so this setting right now, the very first event of our campaign for president, is an example not only of the way that I wish to campaign across this country for every single American, and I could care less your party persuasion, your religion, anything other than the fact that right now we are all Americans and we are all human beings and we do everything within our power for one another, for this great country, yeah. and for every generation that follows. This is democracy. And in the spirit of that, I want to make sure that I have a chance to listen to you. This is my first time to ever visit Iowa. This is my first time to ever visit Keokuk. Um, this is my first time to meet most of you here in this room, and so I'm looking forward to the conversation, to hearing what's on your mind, to answering your questions, and even better, if you want to pose the solution to your question from your perspective, from where you live, from how you see things, I am all ears right now. There's no sense in campaigning if you already know every single answer, if you're not willing to listen to those whom you wish to serve, and that's what brought me here along with hopefully a cup of coffee. So, um, so with that, raise your hand, I'll call on you, and, uh, and, and we'll take it from there. Yes, ma'am. I have a three-part question. I know some of the 
I'll repeat the question. <laughs> and you said the price after insurance kicked in was 144? 444. So really great question. Um, her daughter has insurance, so is covered, but after insurance kicks in, her prescription still costs her $444. And the spirit of the question is, there are a lot of proposed solutions to fixing our healthcare system. What Beto do you think we should do? And I think we should begin with the end. What is it that we are hoping to achieve? In my opinion, it is guaranteed high quality health care. Why, why do I say guaranteed? And for everyone, universal. Why do I say guaranteed? Guaranteed because in the instance that you just shared with me or the knowledge we have of a school teacher in Texas who year before last died of the flu because her copay on her flu medication was $119. It is not enough to be covered. It is not enough to be insured. We absolutely must be guaranteed the ability to see a doctor, to take our child to that therapist, to afford the prescription that could literally save our lives, certainly improve our lives. So I think that has to be the goal that all of us share. And some will challenge us and say that's an expensive proposition. And it is, and let's be honest about that. At, at the, the greatest uh, level, of uh, the, the highest cost estimates, we see numbers like $30 trillion over the next 10 years, some of the lowest uh, for a plan like um, Medicare for America. It was introduced by Jan Schakowsky and Rosa DeLauro. You're still looking at $3 trillion. But whatever that expense, I guarantee you, it is a hell of a lot less than what we pay today to lose the people in our lives, to lose the productivity of Americans who are not well enough to go to work, children who are not well enough to learn. So let's make sure that we spread those costs out far more equitably. And then I guarantee you, the dividends that we receive on the investment that we make in the health care of one another will more than pay for the cost of the investment up front. Thank you for, for the question. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, sir. I Since I took your chair, you That's try it. There's your coffee. Buddy. Thank you. Uh, with the many candidates entering the field on the Democratic side, how do we keep this campaign from becoming the zoo that was represented by the Republican Party right. in the last general election? Good, great question. So many amazing candidates running for president right now. It's a great sign that in some important ways this democracy still works. And it is incumbent upon every single one of us because in a democracy, all of us are the government the government is all of us, that we hold each other accountable, not just for what we promise and that what we enact or fail to enact, but how we conduct ourselves on the campaign trail. Critically important that we not denigrate or demean any other candidate. We don't talk about their personal lives. Any single Democrat running today, and I may not be able to enumerate every single one of them right now, would be far better than the current occupant of the White House. So, let's keep this in mind. And, and, and we, can, we can conduct ourselves in this way every single day for the next 11 months until voting begins here in Iowa. Let's remember that each one of us, at the end of this, once we have a nominee, will be on the same team. It doesn't matter whose team you are on today, doesn't matter which, nom which perspective nominee that you back right now. Ultimately, we all have to get on board the same person because it is fundamental to our chances of success that we defeat Donald Trump in 2020. <laughs> and then that we have a movement of people defined not by their differences, but how they've been able to come together to allow the next president of the United States to be successful on these extraordinarily large challenges that will be before him or her going forward into the next four years. So that's the way we'll conduct ourselves in this campaign. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Mrs. Farmer, I'm going to ask you what your thoughts are on the tariffs. And how to get rid of them. Mrs. Farmer, I'm going to ask you what your thoughts are on the tariffs. So the challenge that the president
president seeks to confront of China gaming the international trade system is a legitimate one. We want him to be successful in this. But as I was reminded by a fellow Iowan, when have we ever gone to a war, including a trade war, without allies? When have we first alienated every single trading partner we have, as this country has done under Trump's leadership, before confronting one of the largest economies in the world today, one of the largest markets for soybeans, for corn, for what we produce in Iowa and Texas and around the country? I want us to be successful in holding China accountable. I want to make sure that we are as competitive as possible for what we grow and what we produce in the United States of America. But in order to do that, Let's bring to bear every single ally and partner that we have around the world to do that. Because here's the consequences if we fail. And you can extrapolate from this anecdote what you're seeing here in Iowa. We were in West Texas talking to a pecan grower. Now that pecan grower used to have reciprocal tariffs levied on his pecans when he sold them around the world of 2%. Now, thanks to this trade war, they are 27%. In other words, no one around the world is buying his pecans. And he said, you know what, Beth, though? I know at some point these tariffs will come down, this trade war will end, but those buyers and those other countries and those other markets will find other producers, other countries from whom to buy. And my kids, who I so desperately want to take over this pecan growing operation, they'll move somewhere else. We'll have to subdivide this land. We'll build tract housing here instead of being able to be tied to the land that my parents and grandparents handed down to me. So yes, let's make sure that we hold other countries of the world accountable, but let's not do it at the expense of our farmers, our growers, our producers, those who are fundamental to the success of the U.S. economy, knowing full well that 30% of what you grow here in Iowa is bound for markets outside of the United States. So I want to make sure that we are tough on trade, we hold other county, uh, countries accountable, but we do it in an intelligent and effective way. Thank you for asking. Yes, sir. So, would you speak to the education system? I see teachers in our district struggling every day. They have to take money out of their own pockets to buy supplies, and they're doing the best that they possibly can, but they need more funding to make the schools work. Yeah. It's a great question about public education, and specifically the teachers who are the backbone of public, e public education. Yeah. And the retired teachers who made it possible for all of us to be here, right? So I want to hear from you about what it's like in Iowa. Let me share with you what I learned in Texas. Nearly half of public school teachers in Texas are working a second or a third job, not for kicks, not for extra spending cash, but just to make ends meet, to put food on the table, to buy that medication with a $444 copay just to exist. And at the same time, and the gentleman said this in his question, out of their own pocket, they're buying supplies for their classroom, supplies for the students in them. And we know firsthand that there are teachers who see a student come in on Monday in a pair of jeans and a t-shirt, Tuesday the same pair of jeans and t-shirt, Wednesday the same, by Thursday out of her own pocket, that teacher has bought that child a new set of clothes knowing that it's important for that child's dignity and therefore their ability to learn to be able to hold their head up high and though they don't have the extra cash to spend, they do it nonetheless. Our ability to meet the economic challenges that I just described is only going to be possible if we support our teachers, pay them a true living wage so they focus on only one job, the most important before them, that they have a health care system that they can depend on and retired teachers are able to afford a life of dignity and so, so uh, somebody just pointed out nurses. When I say teachers, maybe I should be saying educators because that's nurses and librarians and therapists, the custodial staff, the bus drivers, everyone who makes it possible. Now, this is another one of these investments where some will say, this sounds like pie in the sky. We cannot afford to do this. We cannot afford not to do this. If we don't make that investment by extent. We are not making that investment in our kids, and then what should we expect for them to be able to achieve in their lifetime? We do not want to be the generation unique in American history that sees our children do worse economically, do worse in terms of educational attainment than we did or than our parents did. 
That's very possible unless we get a hold of this situation up. And yes, it means investment, but it also means that we hold one another accountable. Those school district trustees, the superintendents, means that we invest in teachers not just in their pay, but in their education and their continuing education. Every teacher I've met wants to be the absolute best at her profession, but she also wants us to make the investment in her and her fellow teachers. So thanks for asking the question. Yes, sir. Yeah, your thoughts on the new grade deal. Question is on the Green New Deal. Uh, and by extension, if you don't mind, I'll take the spirit of the question. Um, we face catastrophe and crisis on this planet, even if we were to stop emitting carbon today, right now, at this moment. We know that the storms that we saw in Texas, Harvey, which dumped the, the landfall record amount of rain on the United States of America, as long as we've been keeping records, that claimed the lives of too many of our fellow Americans, flooded people literally out of their homes and businesses. Storms like Harvey are only going to become more frequent and more severe and more devastating, and ultimately they'll compromise the ability to live in a city like Houston, Texas. The droughts that we experienced in the panhandle of Texas, five years straight, and then we got a little bit of rain, and then we went back into droughts again. Those same scientists say those droughts will become more profound, more severe at a town hall like this. I remember a young woman came in with her two children. She was skipping her son's basketball practice to be there. She was going to talk to a Democrat, even though she was a lifelong Republican, because she told me that what her grandparents planted on their farm, what her parents planted on their farm, that she is now trying to plant does not grow. She said climate change, Beth, though, is not something that we have to prepare for. It is something that is here. Let us all be well aware that life is going to be a lot tougher for the generations that follow us, no matter what we do. It is only a matter of degrees. And along this current trajectory, there will be people who can no longer live in the cities that they call home today. There is food grown in this country that will no longer prosper in these soils. There is going to be massive migration of tens or hundreds of millions of people from countries that are literally uninhabitable or underwater, that are above the sea right now. This is our final chance the scientists are absolutely unanimous on this, that we have no more than 12 years to take incredibly bold action on this crisis. My gratitude then for the young people who have stepped up to offer such a bold proposal to meet such a grave challenge. They say that we should do nothing less than marshal every single resource in this country to meet that challenge, to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels to get to net zero emissions, which means that not only must we emit less greenhouse gases, we must also plant those things that absorb greenhouse gases and carbon, and we must also invest in the technology that will allow us to claim some of it that's in the air right now. Can we make it? I don't know. It's up to every single one of us. Do you want to make it? Because your kids, my kids, you know, Ulysses, who in 2050 is going to be just about my age. It's going to be looking back on this moment in 2019 in Keokuk and every moment thereafter to judge what we did or what we failed to do. Because his kids, I'll be thinking about all of us, his kids' life, whether they can even breathe, is dependent on what we do right now. So some will criticize the Green New Deal for being too bold or being unmanageable. But I tell you what, I haven't seen anything better that addresses this singular crisis that we face, a crisis that could, at its worst, lead to extinction. So that the Green New Deal does that, that it ties it to the economy and acknowledges that all of these things are interconnected, that also recognizes that some communities have borne the brunt of pollution more than others right now. The asthma deaths that we have in the United States of America concentrated in some neighborhoods, some people more than others. It wants to make sure that we do our part in making this more equitable and helping those communities that have already been hurt so badly, that we ensure that there are jobs available for those who are looking for work, for purpose, for function in their lives, who do not have it right now and are succumbing to the diseases of despair. And in so doing, make sure that the world's greatest superpower, its greatest democracy, its greatest economy, brings everything that we have to this unique challenge, literally. Not to be melodramatic, but literally the future of the world depends on us right now here where we are. So yes, let's find a way to do this. Sir. Okay, I work in a health 
healthcare, he kind of answered the healthcare question, but I uh, have been to like all the hospitals in this area and I've watched the opioid crisis. I keep getting addicted to it, it's awful. People my age are committing suicide at alarming rates. This is the way that I personally believe we can help send some of this is how are we gonna end uh, prohibition on marijuana on a federal level? Because it's a matter of health, okay, it does wonders for many people with mental illness, including myself. So what's your thoughts on that? Great question. Um, I'm gonna take my sweater off real quick. <laughs> not because he asked about marijuana, okay? Uh, we'll eat preserve. <laughs> no more. <laughs> so we, we lost more than 150,000 of our fellow Americans, our fellow human beings, to drug overdose and to suicide last year. Now, we can either accept that, we can look at it as uh, a force of nature, or an act of God, or we can understand that there may be a human solution to some of these challenges and problems that our fellow Americans, our fellow human beings face. First of all, we should make sure that drug use, drug abuse, drug addiction is treated not as a criminal justice problem that will have you locked up with really no help or hope to get right and back on your feet and have that purpose and function that is so fundamental to your success and freeing yourself from those dependencies. Yeah. We need to make sure that we invest in the resources for mental health care in America. In Texas, largest provider of mental health care services in our state is the county jail system. People with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, getting arrested on purpose because it's the only way that they are guaranteed help. And then we, the taxpayer, pay for them to be fed and clothed and housed and medicated and seen temporarily by a social worker or therapist before they are then again on the streets. And guess what? The reason that so many people on the streets use drugs is not that the drug use led them to the streets. They're on the streets without access to health care, and it's the only way for them to medicate the problems that they have. So that investment in guaranteed, high-quality, universal health care, that investment specifically in mental health care, that understanding that we have to boldly change our criminal justice system to stop penalizing people for illnesses that they have. All of that is going to be the basis of getting this right, of reducing those numbers that I just shared with you, of getting people help who need help right now. What can we do? The wealthiest country, the most medically advanced country the world has ever known, if not be there for each other right now, especially when we have the resources. So let's do that in the last question. And again, it's not the one that made me take my sweater off. We should, to this end, uh, especially since more than half the states in the union have already legalized marijuana in some form or other, they've medicinalized it, they've legalized it for recreational use, we should end the federal prohibition on marijuana. And given the fact, Given the fact, and listen, I say this as a father of a middle school student, where middle schools are one of the fastest growing markets for marijuana sales today. In the black market, they do not ID, they do not care, as long as they can make that sale. In the same time that we've seen marijuana use grow by kids whose brains are still developing and it is not healthy for them, it's going to slow their progress and it may not make them do as well as it would have otherwise in life. In those same 40 years, tobacco use has plummeted. We haven't outlawed it. We treated it as a public health issue. We marketed against it. We made sure that it was not cool. We can do the same thing when it comes to cannabis or when it comes to marijuana. We can free ourselves from the distinction of being the country that imprisons more of its fellow citizens than any other country on the face of the planet. And guess what? By and large, they do not look like this room. They are browner and blacker than most of America. Though people in this country use illegal drugs at the same rate, no matter where they are, only some face arrest, face imprisonment, and when they get out, forced to check a box that says they have a conviction, which diminishes their opportunities in life to hold a job, to raise a family, to get a student loan, and to be successful. For all those reasons, let's end the prohibition on marijuana. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm just curious, what are your thoughts on EBI? There's a question about a universal basic income. And this is a really good question, and I appreciate you asking it. Because it gets at the fact that even though we have record low unemployment in this country, 
Too many of our fellow Americans right now in this community and in my hometown of El Paso, Texas, are struggling to get by. It's not just those school teachers working two and three jobs. It's some of the people who might have worked at that hotel that I said good morning to when I woke up who are working another job at the end of the day, at the end of this shift. So I think that we need to address that problem. That as productivity has gone through the roof in this country, workers' wages and incomes have not kept pace. And while some wealth in some parts of the country continues to hold or increase in other parts of the country, we're losing it and we're losing entire communities. What are my steps to address this? I think when everyone's well enough to work those jobs or start a business or provide for their family, they are going to do better economically. So I think health care is foundational. When you have child care for those little kids so that you can return to the workforce and be at your best, you're going to be able to earn more. You're not going to be as frazzled. You're going to be able to read to your child before she begins the first day of first grade. You're not going to be at your second or third job or riding the bus home from the supermarket. A minimum wage that matches the real minimum needs that we have in our households, we need to get to $15 an hour within the next six years so that everyone can afford to have that one job, focus on themselves, their kids, their families, giving back to their communities. When I asked the clerk behind the desk in the hotel we just asked, I said, tell me about Keokuk. And she said, this is a community that has distinguished itself by service, by public service. Uh, our parks are cleaned by the community. It's not done at taxpayer expense. When there's a problem near the river, we all go in and get after it. I want people to have the luxury to be able to contribute to their community, to coach their kids' teams. Paying a living wage, I think, is, is part of that. And then especially in rural communities in rural America, the federal government, the rest of the country, needs to form partnerships. Partnerships that mean that each side is going to give a little to get something greater than either could achieve on their own. In Texas, we have a problem with broadband in rural communities. You may have that in Iowa as well, where farmers and ranchers and producers literally cannot get online, where people cannot start businesses in their hometown or finish their education after high school because they can't get online. They can't go to Tinder and find a date tonight to find that special person who's going to make the difference in their lives. I want to make sure every American has that opportunity. And if we remind ourselves of our American history, there was a moment more than 100 years ago where only some cities were connected to the electricity grid. We thought some places were more important than others. The companies, corporations, and businesses saw a profit motive in some places and not in others. And so FDR and the help of members of Congress started the Rural Electrification Administration and partnered through co-ops with local communities to invest in themselves with federal backing and support. Let's build up these rural communities. Let's get behind our farmers and our producers. Let's end these trade wars and let's make rural America successful by listening to rural America. Okay, thank you for the question. Yes. Okay, uh, Cynthia's telling us this will be our last one. Um, what are your views on women's reproductive The question is on women's reproductive rights. Every woman should be able to make her own decisions about her own body. Thank you. I cannot tell you how much this means to me. I will remember this forever. Every single one of your faces and what you were wearing and what you had to drink. Uh, Let us remember it. <laughs> serve you as President of the United States of America. Good. Thank you all for having us out. Really, really grateful. Brad, big morning in Keokuk, Iowa for Beto O'Rourke, the three-term congressman from Texas who failed in his Senate bid but is now making a run for the White House gym. You know, we I think we saw their classic O'Rourke. Uh, he doesn't take notes to prep for speeches. He does, you know, kind of like President Trump in that respect, that he sort of goes off the cuff and you, you felt the energy, right? It was palpable. No, quite. De definitely an energetic start. I, I think the other thing is clear is you hear Beto O'Rourke lay out what is essentially the Democratic platform yeah. in this election here on, on teachers, on, on China trade, on the Green New Deal. Uh, he even said our democracy will be a democracy in name only unless we act on money and politics. But when you hear him lay that out, it is clear that voters in 2020, when you compare that to Trump GOP priorities, yeah. will have 
an extremely consequential choice to make, a choice with, with enormous consequences, because the, those two party platforms are miles and miles apart. Totally. Miles apart. Yes, but they have to get there first, right, mm -hmm. through a very yep. crowded field in the primary. Let's bring back in Jess McIntosh, uh, obviously Democratic strategist, a CNN political contributor, and director of communications outreach for the Hillary Clinton campaign. Here's what a lot struck me, Jess, but here's one thing. I didn't hear direct answers. Um, when the first question was about what would you do with my kid whose prescription costs $444 a month even after insurance, I didn't hear, well, here's how I deal with the big pharma companies or here's what I do on allowing you know, the government, Medicare, to negotiate with them. I actually didn't hear an answer on UBI, on universal basic income. What that is is that means that regardless of income or, or, or your you know, resources or your employment status, that every American would get a certain sum of money to get by each year. I didn't hear direct answers. Is that going to matter to voters? He, he did a lot of answering what he called the spirit of the question, which uh, I, I think you, you can do on your first day. I think it's entirely fair to outline principles and, and to talk about values on, on day one. But uh, Iowa voters don't actually appreciate if they ask a specific question right. and you instead answer the spirit of it for yeah. very long. So I, I think pretty quickly he's, he's going to have to come to specifics on, on things like that, especially since the rest of the field has been so policy heavy. And I, I'd like yeah. to point out that sometimes the conversations that happen in D.C. are just completely different than the conversations that are happening in America. Every single one of those questions was a how does this policy affect me and my family and my life kind of, of bread and butter question. There wasn't any horse race in there. Uh, there wasn't any personality. There, there wasn't any character. It was just the policy. And I think this field so far has really been showing that they're willing to be out there and out front on policy. You've seen yeah. Elizabeth Warren really make a lot of headlines with policy yeah. proposals. Like, that's that's exciting. So yeah. so I don't think he's going to be able to to stay in principles and values land for, for too long without getting specific. Yeah, and listen, Iowa voters, they know policy well. Uh, they know the specifics. They ask hard, knowledgeable questions. They, they want hard, knowledgeable answers. One thing, one thing I will note, because it, it, it struck me that the first...